Am I so ready? Okay. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon and good good evening. Um, this is Paul Liu from NC State. Uh, welcome again to this World River and Delta Systems Source to Sync webinar series. Today, uh, we are very glad to invite Dr. Thomas Hoffman, uh, come from the uh, German Federal Institute of Hydrology, come here talk about uh, the Rand River, the Holocene and the Anthropocene sediment dynamics, and from human control to human dominance. So before I introduce Thomas, uh, as always, I will mention we have more than 100 talks so far in the past two years uh, during the pandemic. This is maybe one of the good things of the byproduct during this uh, COVID lockdown and the pandemics. Uh, so uh, uh, we don't know how long we will go, but uh, we will see. But at the same time, if any colleague uh, Please recommend it them, oh, including yourself, if you want to give a river delta related source to sink talks, please let us know. And uh, so we all the previous talk are archived in our uh, on our YouTube channel and also Billy Billy Station. At the same time, we maintain a source to sink a web uh, uh, a Twitter account. Uh, you welcome to follow us for any upcoming talks, news, publication, conference, et cetera. And uh, next week, uh, May 18, uh, we have uh, Professor Yi Jun Xu from Louisiana State University come here to talk about uh, Mississippi uh, Tafaya River, uh, the channel dynamic and implication of the lowland river sediment trapping. So please mark your calendar next Wednesday. So Thomas, as I mentioned, he's currently a senior scientist in the German Federal Institute of Hydrology, BFG. And uh, before that, uh, he graduated from University of Bonn and also uh, studied assistant professor and postdoc in Canada and also uh, guest professor in Aust Austria. And then now since 2018 is a leader of subdivision of free will <coughs> geomorphology. And so uh, his research mainly in sediment dynamic free will system and quantify sediment budget, erosion, sediment deposition. And uh, so uh, uh, he's the first speaker to talk about the Rand River in Europe. So uh, welcome, uh, Thomas. Now you can share your screen. Yes, um, thanks, um, Paul. Thanks very much for um, the introduction and this uh, organization of the beautiful webinar. And thanks for being a part of this uh, webinar series here. Um, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I will take you to a journey to the uh, to Central Europe. So, and I will mainly speak about the River Rhine, which is a central and important river system in uh, in Germany and in Central Europe. And um, <clears throat> yeah, before I start talking about the Rhine, I would like to frame my story somehow using um, the recently um, um, recent publication of um, James Sivitsky et al, um, who was talking about the Earth's sediment cycle during the Anthropocene. He uh, presented these numbers um, earlier on in this webinar here, and um, he was basically stressing the human impact on um, various components on this um, Anthropocene sediment budget of the earth, um, indicating for instance, that soil erosion increased um, three times um, from 1950 to 2010. Um, global reservoir sedimentation strongly increased um, several orders of magnitude. And um, <clears throat> with these um, somehow competing 
um, processes, um, most of the global suspended sediment yield decreased mainly due to retention of sediment in the reservoirs. And um, the same is true for the, for the global bed load, decreasing um, also uh, in response mainly to the um, <clears throat> compilation of um, um, large dams and reservoirs, which um, um, basically stop sediment flowing um, from the land to the ocean. However, um, this is really the global numbers and um, at the region scale, we might see very different um, trends in these numbers we have seen here um, for the global perspective, or processes might be differences, uh, different um, than those dominating at the global scale. And therefore, I would like to um, show you some results <clears throat> um, on what have been achieved on the Rhine um, in uh, Central Europe. Um, so basically um, the major aim, what I would like to present today is what are the major components of the Anthropocene sediment budget of the River Rhine and its catchment and how did these components um, change or what are likely tra trajectories uh, for, for changes. And um, <clears throat> you might ask the question, why are we talking about um, the Rhine. Um, here you see a very nice sketch, uh, which I uh, received from my Dutch colleagues um, representing the Rhine catchment. Paul asked me whether the, there are some river originating in glaciated upstreams, and um, certainly um, the Rhine is draining the European Alps, which are glaciated and is flowing um, <clears throat> through um, mostly through Switzerland along the um, German-France border. Um, and then um, flowing through Germany into the Netherlands and then into the North Sea. So it's, uh, it's certainly a river which has been um, um, very important for, for Central Europe. Um, if you just have a, some characteristics, the size of the catchment is around 185 square thousand square kilometers, discharges around uh, 2,300 cubic meters per second, and um, the suspended sediment discharges around 2.5 million tons per year. So basically, we have uh, heard talks in this webinar about rivers which are much larger, which transport much more water and sediment. And you might ask yourself, uh, so why do we shall we bother about the Rhine? Um, if you here look at the at the um, uh, Guinness list of sediment transport, certainly um, the, the the Amazon, Huanghe, Brahmaputra, they have much larger sediment loads compared to the Rhine, which is only around 2.5 million tons per year. So it's certainly not as important on the global scale, but for developments in Central Europe, it is a very very important river especially if you look at the population. So around 60 million people are living in the, uh, in the catchment of the Rhine and um, it is drained um, <clears throat> from uh, nine different countries. So it's a really a multinational river system and um, <clears throat> it has seen a, a very intensive land use history or history in, in time. And um, so basically the Rhine is um, more or less um, um, used since around 7,500 years when land use started um, in, um, in Europe. And certainly we saw periods in time where the land use uh, it was much more intense uh, compared to today. <clears throat> of course, navigation is, uh, is a, a, a very important uh, point. Uh, today, the River Rhine is a, among the most important shipping lanes uh, in the world and it is the most important shipping lane in Europe. So traffic on the Rhine is really important for the economy of Central Europe, uh, not only for, for the Netherlands, France and Germany, but also for Switzerland. And um, <clears throat> today the transport of annual goods is around uh, 30, uh, 300 million tons a year, which is much more than uh, the suspended sediment transport. So it's it's a really an important river system and um, understanding this river system is certainly very important in terms of um, <clears throat> river management. 
Um, just to show you a nice picture, so that's basically the situation uh, today. You see here a straightened channel um, with groin fields. You see much of the traffic going on, but naturally, um, of course, the River Rhine looked much different. Here you see a, um, a, a painting from the Upper Rhine where you see a very braided uh, river system with many uh, islands in between. So this situation is certainly something which we don't see today anymore. And all these channelization is certainly um, changed the water balance, but also the sediment dynamics in this area. So as I said earlier, we have around since the Neolithic, which started 7,500 years BP, we have deforestation and agricultural land use, which of course changed the sediment cycle and the Rhine catchment. Since the Middle Ages, we have um, formation of embankments and meander cutoffs. We have bio, uh, bifurcation modifications to manage the Rhine, to make it more usable and to protect um, the um, people living along the Rhine from floods. And uh, since industrialization, we have strong narrowing channelization. So this uh, picture here you see in the background is basically um, um, uh, the picture before the industrialization. We have bank protection, we have uh, building of barrages, we have strong shipping and sediment mining and feeding. And certainly another important um, um, period in time um, for river systems in Europe uh, began after 2000 AD, um, when the adoption of the European uh, Water Frame Directive or when the Water Frame Directive was adopted by the United Nations in 2000, with the aim to achieve an integrated river management and river basin management uh, in, in the rivers in, in Europe. So these are certainly important important benchmarks in terms of land use history in the Rhine. And um, <clears throat> just to show you some other pictures, how it looked like. So basically, this is the situation um, <clears throat> um, of the, this, um, this is certainly the can I laser pointer. This is certainly the situation of the, of the painting I show you um, just earlier. Um, before 1828 um, <clears throat> and afterwards we call it the, um, um, the Tula uh, correction, um, which basically straightened the, the river channel, forced it into one river channel uh, and um, of course managed river um, in terms of flooding and decreasing the, uh, the malaria threat in the upper Rhine. And um, this was certainly a very um, uh, helpful management um, thing, but also um, caused um, other um, um, eff side effects. Since we um, increased the uh, river channel slope, um, we increased the water discharge and therefore also, of course, we increased the transport capacity of the river, which resulted in strong degradation and channel incision um, after the correction. One um, option um, to avoid um, this channel incision in the, in the Upper Rhine was to build um, dams. Um, these dams, of course, uh, were not only built uh, to prevent the channel incision, but also um, were built to improve navigation, to control the water level. And of course, um, they were built um, to, for hydropower purposes so they, they, they provide energy, um, especially for France <clears throat> nowadays. And so it seemed that many of these issues which were related to channel degradation were somehow um, managed. But um, <clears throat> you see, we have here a change of different barrages. So especially from the um, <clears throat> Swiss German border, we see here a, a chain of, of 10 dams, um, which were built one after the other. Um, further downstream um, to um, prevent, for instance, also the incision of the river channel. Um, because as soon as one dam was built upstream, uh, downstream, um, we had um, the position upstream in the dam, but we still had the issue that the sediment was retained. And of course, um, incision started um, downstream of that dam. Um, to somehow um, manage the sediment and prevent um, channel degradation. Um, we have to um, 
to do uh, massive management options and massive management sediment management using um, sediment nourishment with ships. Here you see pictures. So basically we have um, sediments or rocks uh, which are um, <clears throat> transported to the ship um, from another place in the, in the Rhine catchment. And then the ships go um, to the places where we have strongest incision. And then um, that we, we nourish the sediment um, <clears throat> to the channel beds um, to prevent uh, further in, incision. Because incision, of course, um, drops down the, the water level um, and the, with the water level drop down, the um, groundwater levels in the floodplain would um, uh, decline. And this, of course, um, would then um, limit uh, the agricultural production in the, in the floodplains around the Rhine, which are important agricultural areas in Germany. So um, this was just one, one of the effects uh, which we want to prevent here. And um, so we, there's strong management going on here, and, um, but there's also another very interesting story, which is mostly um, um, presented by our colleagues from Utrecht, um, from, um, from the Utrecht University and Altares, which really made a very, very nice um, compilation of the stratical record. Hey, hey Thomas, the I'm sorry to disrupt you. So wh wh what's your meal of sediment nourishment? The, how much sediment did you put on the river upstream in you know, the last slide? Um, I, will, I will give more details in a couple of minutes. On okay, that. that's yes. very, very unique. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will give more information on that later on. Um, okay, um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, yes. Um, the other interesting side story with Rhine is that we know from this re really nice work from our Dutch colleague, that the Rhine was basically, uh, or the Rhine Delta was a coastal lagoon, which acted more or less as a complete sediment trap uh, since around 9,000 BP. And um, this means in terms of sediment budgeting, we can close our sediment budget and derive really nice numbers on the Holocene timescale um, to, um, to understand sediment dynamics here in this river system. So from that point, um, <clears throat> from this short introduction into the Rhine, I would like to show you two studies. And this will come back to the question of Paul. So we, are, um, um, we were asking ourselves, what are the major components of the Anthropocene sediment budget of the Rhine? And um, the other question was, how did these components change and what were likely trajectories? So basically we will start um, with the first question. So what is the Anthropocene sediment budget of the Rhine? And um, this was basically studied um, <clears throat> by the Federal Institute of Hydrology um, in uh, cooperation with the Commission on the Hydrology of the Rhine and uh, with the University of Aachen. And um, we analyzed the sediment budget um, in very detail. And I think this is one of the most detailed um, sediment budgets we have. And if you like to read more about this, um, we uh, published one, um, one paper in Earth Science Reviews. This is uh, in English summary. And then we have a very long uh, report in German, which is uh, freely available. <clears throat> And uh, what were the goals of these sediment budgets? Uh, it was uh, the quantification of downstream fluxes of sediments through the Rhine system, determination of the sources and sinks of these uh, sediments, and then um, to compile a sediment budget from source uh, in, the, in the Alps, in the Swiss Alps, down to the mouth into the North Sea. And this um, 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 fractionated in different grain sizes so along gravel, sand, silts, and clay. And um, <clears throat> here you see uh, the longitudinal profile um, of the Rhine starting in the Alpine um, section where you have very steep channel slopes. Then we have the Lake Constance in between, which is a, a, a glacial, um, deepened uh, lake and uh, which is uh, basically um, retaining all the sediments which are coming from the Alps. Then we have this impounded section where we build um, not only one dam, but a chain of various dams um, to um, manage the water level and um, <clears throat> um, for mainly for shipping, but also for hydropower generation. 
as I said before. And then we have below Iffetzheim, we have the free flowing Rhine where basically no um, dam is built um, and until it reaches um, the, the Delta um, <clears throat> in, in the Netherlands. And then uh, of course we have the Delta in the lower part. And we basically calculated um, sediment budgets for all these different uh, river stretches and um, <clears throat> And um, we, as I said before, we calculated these for coarse gravel, fine gravel, sand and silt and clays. And um, so the question is, how did we do this? Um, what components did we basically um, consider here? We have, um, we, as I said, we divided the river in, in various stretches and we estimated the input from upstream. We estimated the input from the hill slopes we estimated the input from the tributaries. And um, of course, um, we estimated also outputs. So in floodplains, in the growing fields, but also downstream output. And we also analyzed the um, channel changes, um, which basically um, <clears throat> are considered as, as a change in the storage component. So if, if we add all these um, uh, inputs, uh, and if we add all the outputs, and um, subtract input from output, we will then have a change in storage, which is translated to a change in the river uh, of the elevation of the channel bed. Um, for that study, we used more than 60,000 measurements um, regarding bed load, suspended load uh, measurements, um, but also grain size composition, bed elevation changes, so we use quite a lot of information we, which we have um, from the Rhine and um, put all these uh, information together to compile the sediment budget. I don't go into too much detail here because this will um, explode our time. But if you are interested, have a look at uh, the different uh, publications from that. Just to give you an impression, these are basically on the left side, you see here, um, the stations where we measure the bed load, especially in the free flowing Rhine, we have no bed load in the impounded sections. And um, these on the right side, you see um, the monitoring station for the suspended sediment load in the, along the Rhine, um, which were used um, for this uh, budgeting. So why did we differentiate between the coarse and the fine fraction? Of course, we have different importances of these different fractions, um, basically sand and gravels, the size fraction larger than um, 63 uh, microns is um, transported as bed load. It is uh, a channel, it's, it's forming the channel morphology <clears throat> and um, therefore it has a different imp importance than the fine fractions. And um, here you just see some pictures of how basically the bed load um, is estimated how um, we um, estimated the supply and um, um, dredging of sediments. And um, just to give you a short uh, idea of how this works. So basically this here in the, in the bottom is our sediment, uh, bed load sediment sampler, which we use at the Federal Institute of Hydrology to measuring bed load. And um, <clears throat> Results um, for uh, the gravels and sands are basically shown here in this uh, in this graph. And um, what just to give you a short introduction, what these graphs mean. So basically, you see here um, budgets for the Alpine Rhine, the impounded upper lower um, lower Rhine, the upper Rhine Delta, and the lower Rhine Delta. So these are the different stretches. Um, these dotted bar here represents the river channel. If there is sediment deposition going on, we have a surplus of storage uh, presented here in orange. If there is channel degradation, so channel incision, we have a negative um, storage here. And this is presented with these blue bars. And if sediment is supplied to the river, then it's, you see these arrows here on the left side. If it's um, output of the river, you see the arrows here on the right side. And um, <clears throat> what you basically see, um, um, if you compare the impounded section where we have all these dams along the Rhine, you see that the arrows, independently of what kind of processes they represent, they are very narrow, which means that there is only very little sediment transport or little input and output. <clears throat> 
And um, something else I would like to um, highlight here is um, um, below um, the impounded section of the Rhine, all the Rhine uh, levels are still uh, um, characterized um, by decreasing bed level, uh, <clears throat> bed level elevations, which means that um, the, 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 the channel bed is acting as a source for sediment in, in the Rhine. Um, uh, this is certainly somehow related to, to this um, impoundments and uh, withdrawal of sediment in the in, impounded sections. And um, one thing I would also like to highlight, the biggest arrows here um, are uh, related to the artificial supply of sediment. So that's basically what Paul uh, asked me. So how big is the is the supply of sediment um, <clears throat> um, into, the, into the Rhine. So, and you see here, one of the biggest terms, um, components in, in this uh, sediment budget here, especially in the upper Rhine, is this arrow. And this arrow represents the artificial supply of sediment into the Rhine, as you could see in these earlier pictures with the ships. So, um, and this is overall 0 0.8 million tons per, uh, per year. So we put in 0 .0, 0 0.8 million tons um, <clears throat> of sediment um, into the Rhine um, each year. And about the half of this is taken from external sources. So from gravel mines uh, in the Black Forest, which had to trans be transported um, to the Rhine and um, to have enough material to, to supply it to the Rhine. And this is solely done to prevent the river to, to, to incise uh, into the channel bed. You see, there's still some incision going on, um, but this incision would be much, much, be, uh, much greater uh, <clears throat> if we would not supply artificial sediment. But you see also here this o, uh, ODR, that's, that's basically the dredging. Um, <clears throat> this means we have to take out the sediment at certain places again, because the, the, we supply it at, the, at, at Ifitzheim, which is the most downstream dam, uh, because the Rhine is uh, tending to erode sediment there. But um, the, as the channel gradient is getting lesser and lesser, much of the sediment is deposited again. And um, to um, maintain navigation in the Rhine, we have to take it out to keep a certain um, water, side, water depth to maintain shipping along the Rhine. So we have not only to dump it into the Rhine, but we have to take it out at some places and redump it in other places. And um, that's certainly really an Anthropocene story here, I guess. And certainly this is unique uh, somehow in the world. And um, you can see here, these are these places are in the, in the upper and middle Rhine, in the lower Rhine, and also in the Rhine, um, <clears throat> in the Rhine Delta. You see one of this biggest component is the dredging here, especially in the harbors in, in the Netherlands, uh, which has to be done to maintain um, the uh, operationability of the harbors in the Netherlands. <clears throat> so, and if you then look uh, along the sediment load, um, um, especially for the coarse fraction, so these are uh, uh, couples, uh, stones and sand, so um, yellow is the sand, you will see um, that there are variations of the suspended of the loads, um, sediment loads here. And you see basically there's any or not much load going on in this impounded section. We have very high loads in the Alpine Rhine, as I said, but much of the sediment is trapped in Lake Constance. Then uh, limited sediment transport in this impounded section. And then we have a strong increase of, of the sediment load, um, uh, especially of these coarse fractions due to the uh, nourishment of sediment. And then you see this is decreasing because um, the, the gradient of the Rhine is declining. And then we have um, different up and downs, which are strongly related to the dredging and um, dumping of sediment into the Rhine for, for the sake of sediment management and the sake to maintain navigation in the Rhine. As I said here, just a picture earlier. So this deep increase here, is related to the sediment supply. And um, here you can see um, the, the amount um, 
uh, basically this is the supply here on the on the um, top top side, and this is the redrawal of sediment supply. You see here in Iffetheim alone, we supply around 0.3 million tons um, of sediment each year, and much of the sediment is taken out um, <clears throat> in a big basin here in uh, upstream of um, uh, no downstream of mines. Uh, where the sediment would um, um, uh, prevent um, shipping um, because um, the sediment is tended to, to, um, to deposit here in this section. Um, just to, as I said, just to uh, relate these, um, the, the, the current situation with a long-term perspective, we see that um, the study shows us um, a, a sand and gravel load of the, uh, around 0 0.7 million tons per year. And this was estimated um, by um, Achilles Erkens and Roy Frings um, <clears throat> on a longer time perspective or a pre-human time perspective. You see there is some decrease, but given the large uncertainties, you can basically argue we are doing quite fine in maintaining the bed load of the Rhine um, with these uh, massive um, supply of sediment. So these are just the main findings here. Again, I don't want uh, to go to detail here just to save a little bit of time. I guess um, you can read through this um, later on uh, on YouTube if you like. Okay, um, now I would like to stress the, um, the fine fraction, which is basically the silts and clay fraction, <clears throat> uh, which relates to 90% of the transported sediment here. And of course, this um, uh, silt and clay fraction, fraction has an important co control of water quality in contrast to the coarse fraction. And it is an important carrier of nutrients and contaminants. And um, therefore, of course, it is important to consider these fractions as well. Um, sim similar as for the coarse fraction, we came up with this um, budget approach here. We estimated the various inputs and various outputs. You see, we also considered abrasion from the coarse fraction um, as long as or as soon as um, the sand is abraded, um, we will um, receive from the sand fraction silts and clays. We considered <clears throat> um, bad level changes in um, the delta, um, which are basically silt and clay um, changes. And uh, we, of course, considered uh, diffusive inputs from the banks, but also um, from, the, um, 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 <clears throat> from other sources. Um, much is related to the suspended sediment transport, um, which is um, uh, calculated um, multiplying the uh, um, filtered uh, suspended sediment concentration with a discharge. So this is basically for the upstream input, for the tributary inputs, and um, for the downstream input <coughs> uh, output. Um, we consider the output into the floodplains uh, as these are important um, so sinks of um, sediment. So we estimated um, floodplain deposition using uh, cesium uh, 137 <clears throat> in um, various stretches, and um, <clears throat> um, where we also, as I said earlier, and um, we um, considered the input through the ab abrasion of the coarse fraction. And um, this is basically the, the the results of this budget for the silt and clays. Again, you see the same graphs as for the coarse fraction. Um, the arrows are now much bigger. This is basically uh, due to the fact that much more silt and clay is transported compared to coarse um, gravels and sands. And um, <clears throat> um, this is, and basically the sediment is starting here in the Alpine Rhine going uh, through these different sections and ending up in the North Sea downstream here. And um, as I said earlier on, we have this strong sediment supply. So one of the biggest components here is the, the um, output um, from the Alps. So it's 2.9 million tons of silts and clays um, coming from the, um, from the European Alps. But all of this sediment is deposited in Lake Constance. And so basically we have a decoupled system um, here in, in terms of, of the uh, sediment uh, flux um, from the Alps. 
And um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and um, most input into the Upper Rhine is basically coming from the Aare. The Aare River is um, um, draining into the Rhine, has a basically much more sediments um, than what is coming out here from Lake Constant. And um, this is one of the most important sediment sources for, for the um, high Rhine and the free flowing Rhine. Again, we have very strong um, controls um, <clears throat> of um, artificial um, uh, inputs or outputs. And this is basically these big errors here relate to the sedimentation um, in the reservoirs along the Rhine. So these are very, very important in terms of the silt and clay fraction still. Um, <clears throat> another important source um, for, um, for the Rhine is of course the tributaries. So much of the, uh, of the um, suspended sediment is low, uh, load is uh, originating from the tributaries, which receive um, finally their sediment from, from the whole, uh, soil erosion um, due to the agricultural land use. You see floodplain deposition is also an, a very important um, component in these, um, <clears throat> in these sediment budgets. It's not one of the biggest component, but we leave, uh, as, as the um, water and the sediment is um, flowing from upstream to downstream, uh, we lose quite a substantial amount um, due to um, floodplain deposition. And if you now again look at this um, 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 longitudinal profile from the Alpine area down to the North Sea, you see highest um, suspended sediments loads are basically coming from the Alps but all the sediment is trapped in Lake Constant. And then we have a stepwise increase um, of the suspended sediment load <clears throat> due to the supply from the, from the tributaries. And then in the lower Rhine, we have um, strong decreases of the um, suspended sediment loads um, due to sediment deposition in different components. <clears throat> and this is basically the full picture and you see that this light yellowish colors here, which relate to clay and silt is the largest component. So suspended sediment load is much higher than um, the coarse fraction. Um, again, the summary for the fine back, uh, budget, I will leave it uh, to the audience to have a look at these uh, aspects um, later on again. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and now I would like to use the last minutes um, to somehow look a bit, a little bit in more detail about the changes, because what we saw here in this, in the sediment budget was basically the average conditions between 1990 and 2010. And um, the major question was, um, how did these different components um, changed in history, um, but also um, in, in more recent times due to this um, massive management going on in the Rhine. And um, one of this major information, which is also used for the sediment budget um, um, along the Rhine is our suspended sediment monitoring, uh, which is uh, maintained by the German Water and Shipping Authority and which started in the 1970s, where we have around 65 stations along the German waterways and where we sample around five liter each working days on these stations. And then this uh, material is uh, filtered gravimetrically um, to calculate the total suspended sediment, which basically considers the mineral and the organic fraction. And for this um, um, very nice um, and long-term monitoring, um, we were of course able to, um, um, to calculate trends in uh, suspended sediment transport in these rivers. Since uh, this, uh, the, the monitoring system um, was more or less since the 1970s unchanged, so we have a very homogeneous um, data set to evaluate changes um, <clears throat> in the suspended sediment transport. And um, therefore, we um, looked mainly on the suspended sediment concentration. We did various um, uh, trend tests um, using Mancandle and the sense slope. Um, we considered only stations where we have more than 50 years um, <clears throat> with more than 185 um, samples per year for the time from 1990 to 2010. That, that doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, yeah, that makes sense. And um, then we 
um, for in, mainly uh, looked at annual averages. And that's basically what you see if you if you here take into account two stations along the Rhine. One is Maxau in the Upper Rhine. One is Emmerich, which is close to the Dutch-German border. And you see here, if you look at the suspended sediment concentration as milligram per liter, the annual average is decreasing since 1990 to 2010. So, and for both stations, it's around one milligram per liter per year. And if you consider um, that the original concentration is around um, 30 to 40 milligrams per liter, then we have a 50% decline of suspended sediment concentration uh, in these 20 years. <clears throat> there are some differences in the seasons because we uh, also um, considered the uh, concentration differences in winter and summer seasons. But the picture here between the seasons is uh, much less uh, uh, homogeneous. And so uh, in some stations, we see a de stronger decline in summer. In some stations, we see a stronger decline in the winter. Um, but uh, we see, and this is a very consistent picture, at 47 um, stations, a significant decline of the suspended sediment concentration. Here you see uh, the declines, it's the, the sand slope uh, in milligram per liter per year. So typically in some stations, we see declines of up to two milligram per liter per year. In others, we have um, smaller um, values, but um, you see a very, very consistent pattern of this decline. Only a few stations do not see, show any um, changes. And of course, um, first of all, you, you might ask yourself, um, how does this relate to the long-term context of this change? So is this uh, a dramatic change? Is this, um, uh, uh, how, how do we have to deal with this? <clears throat> and to put it into a long-term perspective, I use the um, reconstructed suspended sediment loads <clears throat> um, from this very nice data from our um, Dutch colleagues, which uh, reconstructed the suspended sediment loads um, or supply to the Rhine Delta. And what you see here for the time from uh, 9,000 BP, um, that we had increased um, sediment loads in the early Holocene, and um, they are declining into the middle Holocene, um, down to around 1 million tons per year. And this de decline is certainly um, somehow related to the adjustment from post-glacial to Holocene climatic conditions. Um, so from the shift from more or less braided river system down to um, meandering river systems under fully um, vegetation coverage and the catchment. So this is basically, this decline is basically driven by climate changes from um, post-glacial to Holocene conditions. But what you see here is also that we have in the middle Holocene, we have um, <clears throat> minimum supply rates. And that's basically what we relate as the natural Holocene baseline. Uh, um, <clears throat> when basically the rivers were adapted to the Holocene conditions. And um, so we have a long-term natural Holocene baseline supply um, to the um, <clears throat> delta of around 1 million tons per year. And then um, you see that um, <clears throat> with uh, the widespread uh, deforestation, is, which was going on in the Bronze Age and in the Roman Empire in, in the Rhine Basin, we have an increases of the human-induced um, <clears throat> soil erosion. And um, basically, this continued certainly to some point um, during the industrial phase. <clears throat> And um, now you can see um, how these um, present day changes fit into these long-term perspectives. Basically, these are data from the Emmerich station. So these are the um, suspended sediments loads from the most uh, downstream German measurement station before the Rhine enters the Netherlands. And you basically see we have strong, of course, strong um, variability from year to year. But we see we have these um, declining trends. And we see also that um, the suspended sediment loads are more or less going down um, to the natural Holocene baseline. And um, <clears throat> We can basically argue, yes, suspended sediment loads decrease uh, back to 
pristine levels um, to the uh, natural Holocene baseline conditions, which you might ask, okay, if the cause of these increased conditions here is the human-induced soil erosion, then um, it's something good that happens, uh, that takes place here in, the, in these waterways. <clears throat> Um, of course, then you basically argue what are the drivers of this consistent decline in Germany, and um, I will go through some of these um, drivers. Um, I looked at um, <clears throat> mean annual precipitation changes um, <clears throat> in um, the time scale from 1990 to 2010. Here you have the sand slope of the, the trend analysis for each pixel on, this, on the German map. And you see that there are slight increases, there are slight decreases in certain times, but um, um, <clears throat> most of these trends are marginal and they are not significant. Um, so here you see the, the, um, the significance level, level um, <clears throat> and basically you have only changes, significant changes in these areas which are lighter. The green areas, there are changes are not significant. If we also look at the, at the um, <clears throat> discharge changes, uh, we don't see really a strong impact. And um, all the uh, um, Mann-Candle tests for changes of the discharge, they are insignificant. We have significant changes of uh, suspended sediment concentration, but we have only insignificant changes of mean annual precipitation and discharge. So I basically argue that climate does not seem to be a, a, a important control. Uh, of course, the other big story always brought up on a global scale is damming and building of, um, building of dams and reservoirs. Um, but here in our study, we mainly focus on the time when most of the dams and reservoirs in Germany were already constructed. Most of the construction of dams and reservoirs took place from 19 um, to 1985. And um, here we are focusing on the time when there no, were no more uh, or only marginal uh, construction of dams. And, um, we still have a 50% decline of the suspended sediment levels, so it is not really likely that um, damming can explain much of the decline in the last decades. Um, <clears throat> then, of course, you can ask yourself whether land use changed strongly, and um, that's the reason why you see here these uh, colors um, for, for, the, for the map in Germany. And these areas which are green, especially here in the east of Germany, there we have an increasing forest color, but um, <clears throat> areas where we have yellowish color or um, <clears throat> even reddish color, there we have an intensified um, um, land use during the last 20 years. So basically it's a change in the NDVI, which is increasing or decreasing. And um, you see the picture is very scattered. and. Um, we have areas where it's getting greener, where we have more forests, um, but um, we have strong decline of, for instance, of suspended sediment concentration in the Weser River without any ch strong changes of, of the land use or the NDVI in this, uh, in this respect. And still we see um, declines of suspended sediment concentration. And so there must be something else. So, and basically I think, Climate change, reservoir dams, and extent of land use is only a secondary driver. Um, which is, seems to be more important is the conservation agriculture. So if you look at um, typical um, soil erosion rates under conventional agriculture, we have 45 tons per hectare. And if you look at conservation agriculture, soil erosion is strongly decreasing. So it might be that a strong effect here uh, which uh, plays um, a role is the, the soil, soil conservation measures which were um, <clears throat> installed in Germany during the last decades. <clears throat> but it's, unfortunately, we don't have um, no, no consistent large scale information available, which I could present here. And um, so, and another important topic seemed to be that um, while all these big dams, they were built early on, but um, Many reservoirs and flood retention basins were constructed since the 1980s, which are basically small features, but they retain um, sediment and um, only small amount of sediments, but they are a large in number. 
So it might have happened that these small retention basins, which were strongly increased in number due to, um, uh, due to all these issues and flooding during the last decades, that they have a strong impact. <clears throat> so basically, these might be the primary driver controlling the changes of the suspended sediment in the rivers. Okay, in summary, we see a consistent decline. We are getting back to pristine conditions, but still we, have, we are missing the smoking gun, which is explaining these strong declines. Um, yeah, and in, in, uh, in general, I basically have two take-home messages for you um, today. So in terms of channel morphology and the bed load, we see strong effects on damming, of damming and um, river channel management. And as I hopefully could show you, this can these to prevent these or impede these negative effects of um, root channel management and damming, we have to have a continued sediment management in these uh, river systems. And um, this is mainly done by um, um, artificial supply, which are to nowadays the largest components in our Anthropocene sediment budget. This is true for the coarse fraction and for the fine fractions. Um, we see that um, we have a, a very strong um, supply of suspended sediment into the river system through soil, import, uh, soil erosion. But here it seems that large scale um, soil conservation measures and um, um, uh, measures for water protection and protection of freshwater ecosystems um, um, massively led to a decline of suspended sediment concentration levels in the German waterways. And um, certainly we are still missing, we, we do not really fully understand the budget and the drivers, but these are from the, uh, from our nowadays knowledge seem to be important parameters controlling the fine budget here. And with that, I um, thank you for your attention. I'm, I, I also like to um, mention my co-authors uh, co and contributors here, um, which are Gudrun Hildebrand, Stefan uh, Vollmer, Roy Frings from the Aachen University, Yannick Baulig, Felix Optehip, Jan Blöte from Utrecht, uh, from Freiburg, Gilles Erkens, which uh, provided much information and of course, the Water and Shipping Authority, which provided all this information. And with that, um, I thanks for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Thomas. This is uh, just a fantastic, uh, a very comprehensive view of the Rhine River. I, I definitely learned a lot. So uh, uh, for our uh, audience, if you have any question, go ahead, go ahead to, uh, I'll mute yourself. Hi, um, I, I have a question. If I don't, if I don't uh, yeah. remember anybody. Thank you for uh, for your talk, uh, Thomas. It was uh, yeah, it was really interesting and <laughs> awfully familiar because um, I'm I'm working on the same region, um, and I was very curious. Especially when you talk about all these sediment nourishment things, and you know, in terms of future river management, um, how how does this work? Like, how does the planning for this work? As in, I can expect that say that now if climate changes, right, your discharge regime is going to change. Um, well, several several things are going to change because of that, which in which in turn will affect the sediment flux. Um, and I can imagine that this has implications for how much you want to nourish. Or, or how or how little and I'm wondering how yeah how this is approached yeah um yeah I, I think one one of the reasons why we have this data why we have these um, um, uh, monitoring networks of the of the bed load and the suspended load in in our river system is to support the water and shipping authority which is um, man, uh, maintaining or which is operating the sediment management with information. And um, <clears throat> beside um, these uh, monitoring networks, we um, also have uh, a continuous monitoring um, um, with uh, echo loads and uh, using um, uh, for, for the bed level changes. 
So basically the bed level is monitored um, on a very regular interval. And um, from the results um, of these um, bed level um, changes, we, um, <clears throat> we see whether um, the, how much sediment is uh, need to be nourished or uh, taken out of the system. So every time when we see um, strong um, uh, um, uh, channel incisions, um, then uh, the water and shipping authorities basically um, advise to um, increase their uh, management or nourishment, sediment nourishment. And in places where we see um, strong deposition, of course, um, then um, the water and shipping authority is um, um, uh, driving to these places and taking this, uh, the sediment out. So the, to, to, to have a sustainable sediment management, um, you have to, it's not just enough to drop the sediment and take it out again, but you have to see whether this um, management is successful or not. And um, therefore we need to guide um, the, 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 the operations with scientific data here. Yeah. And is it, I, would just, I have just a small follow-up question. Is it then the goal to keep things say more or less as they are right now, or just to adapt as it, sorry, or um, yeah, or, or what, as in like, is, is the goal to keep say that now you have like navigation conditions that are fine for your system, right? So is, is this the goal to keep them as they are? And as the vet evolves say, and there's gonna be incision at some locations, bring it back to, to now? Um, basically, human systems always require stable boundary conditions. So, um, of course, we need to maintain um, shipping um, because, um, as, we, as I said earlier, we have um, a, a freight of more than um, um, 900 mil, uh, 600 million tons a year. On, on, and this is, of course, a, a very strong economic um, factor controlling here um, this management. And, and of course, we, we have to maintain a certain water depth um, so that the ships are able to um, uh, go up and down the Rhine at every season. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this is the, the at the moment, the, the primary driver of this management. Navigation. Course, having the, the um, European Water Framework Directive, uh, we also um, are um, advised to achieve a good ecological status. So ecolo ecology, of course, is, um, uh, is um, modifying management practices. But the, the, I would say still the primary driver is to, to maintain shipping and to secure a, water, a, a certain water level at any stage of the river Rhine. Thanks. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, don't forget, go ahead. Hi, uh, Thomas, thank you. Thank you, uh, really great to see you again. And uh, thank you for your really uh, excellent uh, talk and uh, I learned a lot about the setting budget and also the uh, sediment management uh, plan in the Ren, River Ren. So uh, I mean, I'm also interested in the sediment feeding program in, in, in your uh, river. So basically uh, there are two related questions. First question is where are the sediment from the, I mean, the artificial sediment supply, where are they come from? Are they from the upstream reservoirs or through the reservoir drag, dragging or are they from the, the mountains or the mountain slopes or, 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 so this is the first question, where, where is the sediment come from? The second question is uh, uh, re re related to the uh, artificial sediment supply, but it annually you uh, roughly you feed the, uh, the river with uh, with one million ton uh, sediment. So this is uh, uh, roughly uh, one third of the total sediment budget. And but can can you imagine if we, we could apply such a, a sediment feeding uh, methods in the in the larger uh, Asian rivers, for example, uh, in the Yangtze River, the sediment budget is uh, four hundred million million ton. And currently they are also face, facing the similar issues, do you think uh, we, we can apply such uh, artificial sediment supply uh, 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 practice? Thank you. Yes, um, thanks for your questions. Um, yeah, so first um, your question, where does the sediment come from? Uh, 
Um, nowadays, we our large fraction is uh, is taken from the uh, so basically the the main sediment nourishment location is here where the mouse uh, the laser pointer is at the moment. So this is the last um, um, dam in the Rhine of the impounded section. And we take a, a large amount of sediment from uh, quarries in the Black Forest, uh, which are um, on the <clears throat> uh, right side of the Rhine. So it's really taken from outside. Um, currently, um, there are some plans to build large um, 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 flooding um, basins here in the Upper Rhine area. Um, because we we saw various floods during the recent years in um, along the Rhine, and um, of course, much of the flooding is taking, or much of the water production is is taking place here in this in this upper section of of the Rhine, and then the flood wave uh, moves down where the big cities are, and um, <clears throat> and of course, we want to um, prevent flooding in these areas. And so, one plan was to lower large parts of the floodplain here in the Upper Rhine for about one meter or 1.5 meter, which then um, uh, are used as retention basins, um, um, <clears throat> um, which um, retain um, the, the city, uh, water. But for lowering, it was basically the idea, if there is, um, of course, when, lower, when we lower the floodplains, then we get sand and gravels, which were deposited by the Rhine. And this could then be used um, for the sediment management and nourishment um, further downstream. And these plans are currently under, const under, yeah, under, under construction. This, of course, is a win-win situation. For the one side, we, um, we get sediment from uh, retention basin construction. On the other hand, we need it here in the Rhine. Um, but the, the, it's, it's somehow a, a political issue since um, flood protection in Germany is a federal um, thing. So it's the federal states which are um, um, which are um, which govern uh, floodplain um, uh, flood uh, prevention. But uh, maintaining waterways is uh, is a nationwide um, 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 thing. So it's not the federal state. It's it's really the the central government, which is uh, um, on a, under uh, control of, of uh, maintaining management. And this seems to be somehow a, a, an issue at the moment. So um, there are plans to not to take it only from gravel quarries, um, uh, which is of course expensive, but to take it out from the river itself and resupply it. Um, but um, yeah, these are the, the boundary conditions um, we, we have at the moment. We have, certainly we have to do it if we do not want to lose large floodplain areas which are used for agricultural production in these, uh, in these areas. And yes, um, as you said, um, yeah, sure. There are many rivers which have much higher um, supply uh, or much higher loads um, than, um, um, than, than we see here in the Rhine. And therefore the question could, is whether this could be uh, useful for, for large river systems as well or not. Um, certainly it's, it's a very expensive thing and it, uh, the costs of course de increase um, with, with the amount of, of sediment you have to supply. And I doubt uh, or, I'm not really sure whether it's really cost effective or whether it makes sense um, to, um, to nourish sediment on, I would say uh, three orders or hundred orders of magnitude or two to three orders of magnitude more than, than we do in Germany. I'm skeptical whether this works or not. And, um, uh, but there is much of, much of the of dredging in Europe is also, is mainly going on in, in the harbor and in the coastal areas. So, and it seems that um, they have sufficient um, uh, nourishment and dredging systems along the coast where they are also, where they take the sediment out of the river and dump it in, in different places, but then it really stays more or less in the system. And um, this could work, uh, but, uh, and then, for instance, here in the Netherlands, we saw much of the, the one of the largest budget components was the, the dredging of silt and clays in, in the Netherlands. 
Uh, we have strong um, sediment management operations going on in the Elbe River, uh, where the amount of dredging and dumping is much higher um, than in the river system itself. But um, not really sure whether this is um, feasible for, um, for uh, rivers where the load is uh, uh, um, two times, uh, two orders of magnitudes larger than here. Um, one thing is, of course, um, what, what, we, what we dump into the Rhine is mostly sand and gravels. And um, of course, sand and gravels, it's um, the, you saw in my graphs earlier on, the bed load is much smaller than the suspended load. So if you really want to maintain the channel morphology, you should more look at the, at the, um, at the transport of sand and gravels, which um, guide then the sediment management. Thank you, great, thank you. Okay. So anybody else from our audience? So, yeah, yeah, uh, hi, Paul. Yeah, I have a question, yeah. Uh, thanks, Thomas. So, yeah, a very quick question. Yeah, I noticed uh, there are a lot of wind decks along the Rhine River. I'm wondering how you consider this wind decks, uh, the wind decks influence on the sediment transport along the river. Because uh, we are also doing a similar work in the Lower Arkansas River in the U.S., and we found the navigation system. Uh, people, the USACE, want to keep the navigation depths for the for the river, so they build a lot of index to um, to gather the water and to let it dredge in, uh, and dredge a lot. So. They dispose of this dredged sediment behind this wind decks. And we also see a lot a significant decline of the suspended sediment load in the river. And uh, but the question is, they just dispose of this sediment behind this wind decks, but they actually didn't uh, extract this sediment out of the river system. But uh, I'm wondering how you consider this uh, Dredging, dredging projects influence on this sediment transport in the river system. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I'm not really sure what what you mean with wind wind decks. Yeah, this decks just uh, mm, uh, uh, how to. Well, there are a lot of terminology to describe these decks. Probably in your in one of your slides, you just shoot this Windex. I'm not sure what you called it in the Germany, but uh, um, uh, probably if you can show the uh, slide again. Uh, I try to something that. like a groin or jetty or something. <clears throat> the, the groin fields. Yeah, I guess you mean the groin yeah, fields. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we have a picture of the groin fields here. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. This is basically um, here um, these groin fields, um, so um, <clears throat> which are one of these uh, management options. Um, you narrow the river channel and increase the water level. Um, and um, on the other hand, if the discharge increases, then the water is flowing across these um, groin fields and prevents further incision during during floods. And um, so this is basically the, the idea why we have them. And, um, and of course, um, there is much sediment uh, depositing in these groin fields. And um, there was a study um, in, from, from the colleagues in the Netherlands uh, where they uh, did um, uh, sediment budget studies on, on the sedimentation and erosion of these groin fields. And it seems that during um, <clears throat> Um, uh, I'm not sure whether I got it right during um, low water conditions. Um, I guess there was erosion of sediment in these groin fields and during floods there was deposition of sediment in the groin field. So um, anyway, in terms of the, of the budget, the, 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 these groin fields act as sources and sinks um, for during different discharge uh, stages. And um, 
But in the long term, um, the, the, the long term budget of these growing fields is more or less balanced. So there's uh, on the long term, the, the, the elevation of these growing fields stays more or less the same. And therefore, it does not really con uh, does not really um, change our long term um, suspended sediment flux. But um, I should refer to some studies from from our um, Dutch colleagues who who are expert in these um, because these growing fields are very important features in the Netherlands. We have some in Germany as well, um, but they are, they have hardly any effect on 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 the sediment budget. Yeah. I'm not sure whether this answers your question, um, but I would say if, from our upstream perspective, we have as Germans, um, the, the groin fields are not modifying um, the, the, the sediment dynamics very strongly and therefore have only marginal effects on, on, on our uh, management operations regarding the nourishment and dredging. Yeah, cool, cool. thank you. Hey, hey, Thomas, I have a question. You know, if we look at the upper run, the, the river session above the Lake Constance. Yes. Is any sign show the dramatic change? How compare the upper run, middle run, and lower run for the high part? Because I don't know is any dam any significant human impact in that high po high run portion? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's certainly a very interesting story. And um, mainly um, the, the study of these long-term changes of the suspended sediment um, is focusing in this, uh, in this uh, area where we have, um, um, let's say where we have a map of, of the Rhine catchment here. So basically these large areas here, which contribute much of the suspended sediment loads, um, <clears throat> there are, this is arable land. And um, so this um, agriculture is certainly one of the major driver of the, of the um, silt and clay fraction here. Mm. And, um, <clears throat> and here in, the, in this alpine area, we have certainly different processes going on. So we have rock falls going on. We have strong gravitational mass movements. We have debris flows. So all these torrent, um, torrent driven um, um, aspects. And then of course we have glaciers in the upstream areas and um, sediment supply um, strongly um, is controlled here by climate changes. And, um, mm. but I'm certainly, or at, at the moment, I'm not really aware of a long-term um, study which um, um, <clears throat> analyzes the, um, the supply here in, in, this, in this area. We have, um, of course, um, reconstructions of the um, sediment supply to Lake Constance. And um, what we see mm. here, is basically on this very long time scale, Holocene or post-glacial Holocene time scale, we ah. see that um, there is massive supply of sediment to Lake Constance um, at the uh, during the post-glacial period. So as a paraglacial cycle, I would say. So when the glaciers, um, um, the large glacial ice sheets, when they were degrading, uh, we had of course massive supply to the forelands. And um, usually the Lake Constant, um, let's see whether I find the nice picture, of this aerial view from Lake Constant, here it is. Um, <clears throat> basically um, the Lake Constant was once um, 60 kilometers upstream. Um, so this is the, the current um, delta um, to, the, to Lake Constant, which is here at Bregenz. And it was here at, at Ruhr, uh, which is a Swiss um, town, which is uh, located mm. 60 kilometers upstream. And during the post-glacial time, this was the start of Lake Constant. And this infilling of this 60 kilometers was basically the paraglacial signal from the massive supply from the glaciers. And on this long time perspective, we see a strong decline of this uh, sedimentation in Lake Constant as we get into the Holocene and uh, where the stable, where the slopes are getting more stable, where gravitational mass movements um, are getting less, 
um, but uh, and um, but still we have very very high rates in this area because we have the strongest uplift rates of the alpine of the European Alps in this area and the the steepest uh, um, um, mountains uh, join with very brittle rock in this area. So the, the massive uplift rates and massive denudation rates are um, observed in the European Alps in, these, um, in this alpine um, uh, catchment of the Rhine. And mm. uh, uh, yeah, but I'm not sure what the conditions during the last decades were. So whether this um, human impact strongly changed um, the sediment transport in the Alpine Rhine. I'm not sure about that. You know, uh, this lake is uh, because this is naturally formed uh, after post-glacial during, you know, uh, uh, during the Holocene. This could be a very interesting um, example uh, for, it's different from many modern reservoir because mo most of reservoir is less than 100 years. And yeah. so this one is uh, already 10,000 years. So yes. uh, in the upper reach, the sediment dumping to this lake could be a very good, uh, you know, comparison analog for any future of those bigger reservoirs in terms of sediment infielding. Fielding. And I read some article that 2.5 million uh, is mainly dumped to this lake, right? Um, dumped into Lake Constance, or yeah, uh -huh. the annual sediment discharge from the upper reach about two point five million per year. Yeah, this is around two point two two point nine million. Oh million. yeah, three million. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, that's certainly what 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 is supplied from the Alpine Rhine here into into the delta. Um, uh, where it is. Yeah. So that's basically the si supply of the Alpine Rhine here into the Delta. And um, these are these 2.9 million tons a year. And um, <clears throat> and you see there's hardly anything going out. Um, wow. Uh, yes. Because um, we have uh, around 3.9 million tons a year of deposition here in this, um, in this lake. Um, um, if we consider also the supply from the from, uh -huh. from the tributaries, but nothing is going out. So if you, yeah, if you look at the Alpine, at the Hochheim, um, just below the the um, the um, the lake, it's really clean water. Yeah, huh? It's a filter. The lake definitely filter. That's yeah. very interesting. And uh, uh, actually, you know, the high swan dam on the Nile River, you know, just uh, like form that kind of reservoir lake, like. Uh, um, also, the Xiaolongdi Dam in China, the Huanghe, you know, show a similar trend. It's a delta inside the res reservoir propagation. And yeah, yeah. so, this, anyway, a very, very interesting and very, very nice data set and a comprehensive review. And thank you so much. And You're welcome. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's really fantastic. So, if you know any other question, I think we can stop here. That's uh, very good, Thomas. Very good talk. You're welcome. Thanks very much for yeah. um, for this platform for organizing everything. And um, yeah, thanks for for uh, inviting me. And um, I'm looking forward to the other talks. Sure. Yeah. And please encourage or invite your friend, a colleague, uh, to contribute a talk. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay.